The Honorable Justices of the Supreme Court of the State of Iowa. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now in session. We're going to have four cases before the court today. The case of Iowa Supreme Court Attorney Disciplinary Board versus William Raniger is hereby submitted without oral argument. And the case of State of Iowa versus Ronald James Brimmer is also submitted without oral argument. Our first case today is State of Iowa versus Deontay Ellison. And it appears to me both parties are ready to proceed. So Ms. Um, Knipper, you may go first. May it please the court, counsel. Penalizing Mr. Ellison for not producing the uh, physical evidence or producing physical evidence was a violation of his Fifth Amendment right. Production of any physical evidence would have been um, compulsive, compulsory and testimonial because it expresses knowledge and information that he holds and it is, was incriminating. And none of this knowledge would have been a foregone conclusion. The Fifth Amendment provides that no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. And the Iowa Constitution doesn't have the same provision um, explicitly, but it um, applies this, this uh, principle in its, through its due process clause. At issue here is section 704.2b2, which is part of the, uh, the amendments known as the stand you ground laws. And what this does is that it says that a person using deadly force shall not intentionally destroy, alter, conceal, or disguise physical evidence relating to the person's use of de deadly force. And the court, um, instructed the jury along these lines and it told the jury it could not intentionally or that a defendant could not intentionally destroy, alter, conceal, or disguise physical evidence. And if the jury did, or excuse me, um, and the jury could consider this a duty in determining whether the defendant was uh, acted with justification. Gibbs. We talked about subsection one of the statute that you just read from. And that statute says that if a person uses deadly force, the person shall, no shall notify or cause another to, to notify police. Subsection two, the one that you just quoted, doesn't talk about having to notify anyone. And so in Gibbs, we sort of talked about how the Fifth Amendment gives a right to silence and subsection one requiring you to, in essence, speak violates that, but subsection two doesn't really require you to, to speak. It just says that you can't destroy, alter, con conceal evidence. And what happens is here is that um, it's compulsory like, uh, the court found Gibbs to be compulsory because you had to choose between your right, your Fifth Amendment right, and um, and you know turning this or yeah if, you know reporting the offense because and then um, this is sort of the same way in that you would have you had your Fifth Amendment right versus turning over evidence of the physical evidence of the fence. So you're, you're having to weigh these, these two things and that's why it's compulsory. Do you actually have to turn anything over or is it just you can't destroy it, conceal it? Destroy, um, the concealing part is what I consider the, the having to produce because if you don't produce it, then you're concealing it from law enforcement. And so that's, that's where the idea of production is. How is the production incriminating? The production is incriminating. So once you turn over the, like in this case, it would be the weapon that you've shown um, 
You've shown possession, you've shown control, you've actually authenticated by, by being the person, you know, turning it over saying, you know, this is the weapon that was used. Necessary to establish the defense. I mean, the defendant is invoking a defense of justification, justifying the use of deadly force. So I'm not sure what the production compels the, other than something helpful to the defendant. Well, the courts, other courts have found that it is incriminating, even though, you know, a defendant was trying to claim self, self-defense or, um, I, I guess that, yeah, that, I mean, that's the, that's the reasoning that they, that they've used is that. Self-defense and just said, I didn't do it. Then there's no issue with the statute and there's no issue with the instruction. Right. Gonna do it? Be, he won't. I mean, he's not going to do that because he's on video, and so you know his his choice here is a self defense claim, and then once you know they have the gun, then they can you know do tests and all sorts of other things, which also adds to the evidence against him. Miss Kniff, from my understanding of Fifth Amendment law, back from when I was involved in criminal defense. Um, was that uh, objects, you know, physical objects, uh, tangible objects, per, th that production is not per se really covered by the Fifth Amendment. And that if there's a concern that when the defendant produces the object that they're implicitly making some kind of testimonial statement which might be protected by the Fifth Amendment, then the solution is you designate someone else as the custodian. I mean, the, the statute per se seems to not, to me, to not infringe on Fifth Amendment territory at all. It just says, don't conceal, destroy, etc. It's kind of like an obstruction of justice type statute, right? Right, 1793, yes. But, I mean, it goes further than that because, I mean, again, I still th think the concealed portion is, is, a co is a compelling because to turn the, the gun over, any physical evidence over, and that when you do, it becomes testimonial. You, you've raised a Fifth Amendment objection. Do you have any other objection to the instruction other than the Fifth Amendment? No, I, the Fifth Amendment is the only in, um, objection that we have to. There was no objection below that this didn't apply in the situation factually. There, well, there was. He, I would have to go back and read the text, but the defense attorney says. Um, he didn't. Th well, now I'm thinking about more the the um, illegal activity. That was where he talked about, I don't think this really applies. Challenge here that there was no, that in fact um, there was, Mr. Ellison did not conceal. Um, that wasn't challenged. That I would have to look back and to say one way or the other. How was he prejudiced by the instruction? How did that hurt his defense? Insofar as that it again, it still shows him to still be in control and have, have the gun, and then the gun goes into evidence and you can do tests. With a gun. But then he, you know, the question is, did he maintain control and, and continue to have the gun? Here's, my, here's the question I have. The, the instruction is two sentences. Um, the first sentence is, sort of just a recapitulation of the statute, okay. The second sentence says, you may consider whether the defendant complied with this duty whether, when you decide whether deadly force was justified. I don't know where that sentence comes from. It's not in the legislation. It doesn't give the jury much guidance. Uh, the jury is just told you can consider, well, how much can you consider? How do you factor it in? Uh, does it negate the defense? Does it? you know, take away 20% of the defense. I mean, to me, this is a bad instruction. But 
if the only problem is Fifth Amendment, I'm not sure it is a Fifth Amendment violation. Do you see where I'm coming from at all? Well, I, I do think that this is um, a bad instruction insofar as there is no authorization for that la latter sentence in that, um, I mean, they just restated, as you said, they restated the statute and then they told them you can weigh this or wait, you know, consider this in determining whether the defendant was justified. But I think that goes back to Gibbs where that instruction, um, just the fact that the court instructed the jury uh, on the, um, the first subsection, that, that, that weighed in the uh, state's favor. And, Did the prosecutor argue the instruction in closing? Okay. And, um, I, in volume six, they, that, yeah, they, he talks about it. Um, and he, it's. Would that help you show that the that this was prejudicial? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. It's, it's just you know one more factor of telling the jury that you can weigh this against against the defendant. And the prosecutor said says something along the lines of, and you see that this instruction. And he, uh, I don't remember if he read it to him and stuff, but he, you know. Did the, he, he asked him, did the defendant comply with his duty? And, and I think he's left it then from that point. I mean, normally we ask jurors to find facts. Um, the second sentence doesn't really ask the jury to find a fact. It asks them to make kind of a, um, an open-ended judgment. You may consider when you decide whether the force was justified. Well, how do you consider it? Uh, uh, I mean, this to me, if I'm a juror, leaves me at sea. Um, but that's not your objection, is it? No, the objection was in the Fifth Amendment. But I think when, when you read that sentence, I think it clearly goes against the defendant. I mean, the jurors aren't going to sit there and consider, oh, he didn't turn over this physical evidence or what, you know. So... He must be guilty. The argument that the other instruction was erroneous um, on the duty to retreat. Yeah. Okay. It's up to you. Brief. I don't. I don't really say much more or have much more to say. Uh, and um, than what was said in the briefs at that time that council it on the instruction um, for 29a where it talks about uh, that it's illegal for a person to go armed with any dangerous weapon with the intent to use that weapon against another person without justification it strikes me that that's a bit circular. In other words, to go armed with intent, you must act without justification. And the underlying crime that we're talking about here. I think that's a problem with, with a lot of these instructions in that. So for the, and I'm making say, well, if, for the illegal activity, they said it's going armed with intent, but this is to me so confusing because he's not going armed with intent until Mr. Smothers comes on the scene and then they, you know, start shoving and punching and and then the defendant goes up the stairs or you know he's right he's right in one place and he's up the steps and then he goes to between the cars and I have a I just have a problem in my reasoning about how he can be penalized for going armed with intent when the going armed with intent didn't occur until Mr. Smothers comes on the scene. And um, the, the state, I think you'd agree with me, there's a the <clears throat> 2020 instruction and then there's the pre-2017 instruction. And I believe the state's argument is that the old instruction is outdated by the time of the crime. 
But would you agree with me that the new instruction, which was used, actually made the state's path to the conviction narrower because they had to prove not only was a retreat, the retreat was a reasonable alternative, but that the defendant made no effort toward it. Didn't it actually make it a little bit harder on the state? I think it, I think in some respects, it puts a stronger duty on defendant to, to reach, have to retreat where they had other alternatives and then, well, that doesn't specifically say that he has to retreat. So I don't know that it does. Following that, so prior to the statutory change, it was the state's burden to prove that the defendant had a reasonable alternative course of action, which would include retreat, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm law under the new statute, the state not only had to prove that, they also had to prove illegal activity. So they had to prove an additional thing to negate the justification defense. So it seems like this instruction actually made the case, the state's case, more difficult. And if that's right, what's the prejudice to your client? I think the prejudice here is putting in another crime and I just think in this case, the crime was the result of the um, victim's actions. So I think, you know, that's why I think it's more prejudicial. I see my time is up. Again here. And may it please the court, in light of Constitution Day, let me offer this. The constitutions, the code, and this court compel us to use the law as it is, not as it was, to avoid illegal activities if we wish to stand our ground and use force, and to refrain from intentionally concealing or destroying evidence and the district court gave the right instructions here. Given the course of the discussion we had just before, let me start at the end. And let me offer for the court some guidance in a way to address this Fifth Amendment, the self-incrimination form of analysis. Because you are correct that the right against self-incrimination doesn't have very much to say with respect to physical objects. Now, there are instances then when the act of production is the functional equivalent of a testimonial communication. And that, if you just conduct some general research, you'll see that it's rather plainly laid out there that a testimonial communication, a, in fact, a compelled testimonial communication occurs when it reveals a subjective element uh, of the defendant's thoughts it reveals the existence of a physical object that the state was not already aware of, and the act itself is incriminating. Take, for example, a felon in possession of a firearm. The statute requires somebody to produce that gun. The act of doing so, if they are a felon, incriminates them. That's not the circumstance that we have here. The circumstance that we have here is a statute and an instruction that complies with it. And it says, in short, that um, a person has a duty not to intentionally conceal, destroy, or otherwise um, um, damage physical evidence regarding deadly force. This is, by the way, the very same language that comes out of 719.3, which in fact criminalizes that act. So we're talking about an act, and, and in fact, not so much an act as the absence of one. Right? We, we have a duty not to do something, okay? And so long as we don't do it, it doesn't have the right against self-incrimination, doesn't, if you'll pardon the expression, have very much to say. So here, we have no speech, we have no compelled production, and, by the way, when we consider the right against self-incrimination, we typically look for an invocation as the special concurrence discussed in Gibbs. We don't have that here. There is likewise 
no penalty that attaches to this statute. It simply states that there's a duty. And neither does this instruction direct the jury to an doesn't do anything but um, impose a duty. How, where's the, what's the basis for the second sentence in instruction 32, and how was the jury supposed to use that? This isn't altogether too very uncommon from all the other instructions that uh, the court, district courts will give that you may, for example, um, draw an inference that the defendant intended the natural consequences of his actions, or you may consider the defendant's refusal to give a, um, uh, to give a blood sample if the components of Section 321J have been complied with. Over a gun or not turning over a gun had to do with self-defense when he clearly was using the gun. There's no, you know, no dispute that that was his gun and he was using it. So, um, long ago, uh, we established the notion, the rather commonsensical notion, that typically when somebody uses or acts in self-defense, uh, they will often their post-conduct behavior is reflective of their pre-conduct state of mind, and so we've always been able to comment upon that in closing arguments. Uh, was the defendant's behavior, let's say, for example, State versus Shanahan, where the defendant left the body in the bedroom for over a year, okay, uh, and she claimed self-defense. Um, so that's not, not altogether um, controversial. Uh, the thing that is new, perhaps, about this instruction is that it allows the jury to consider those factors for purposes of determining whether the, and this is important, whether the state met its burden to show that the defendant acted without justification. So in that instance, supposing, for example, there is rather weak evidence that the defendant concealed or destroyed or otherwise altered this evidence, okay? That only tends to make the state's job more difficult. And so in those circumstances, you would say this statute is, or I'm sorry, this jury instruction is something that a defendant might in fact prefer. Because then they could say, well, you know, my post-conduct behavior is consistent with an act of justification. There's no evidence, or they would argue that there is no evidence that I concealed or destroyed this other evidence. You know, if you were the jury foreperson, you know, and you went through all of that, that all sounds reasonably logical to me, Mr. Mullins. But the problem is that th this isn't analogous, really, to those other situations where there's an element, say, a state of mind element, and the conduct is conduct that common sense would tell you might be reflective of the defendant's state of mind, and the and the jury is told they can consider it. This is. Two separate. Th th these are two separate things. There's there's a shooting that occurred, and then later on there's uh, a firearm that that is not produced. Um, and there's no ec and 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 the jury is just told in the first in considering the first whether the first th thing was justified or not. You can consider the second thing, but they're not tied in kind of a in kind of a logical way, the way that the the, uh, the the other examples that you give is, where they go directly, say, to a state of mind element. I offer you an entirely um, unsatisfactory and frustrating answer designed to drive you up the wall if I could, and that is that issue's not before you. Uh, it wasn't preserved. But if I can mollify you for a moment and let me try. The wall, that saves me work. <laughs> left. Um, let me offer you this instead. Uh, if Perhaps it's, it's helpful to consider other instructions that say, you have heard inconsistent statements. You may consider that, and I can't paraphrase uh, any better than anyone else uh, what the full extent of that is, but it's not altogether um, too unusual to say, um, you have an obligation, uh, consider this or that, and you may uh, use it to determine the issues at play, something like that. And I'll grant you that it's, um, that at, at one level, it's relatively vacuous. Um, at another, because it is, and because it's the state that bears the burden here, if there's any problem, it tends to weigh in the defendant's favor, so it's not prejudicial. I'd like to go to the illegal activity issue. Um, 
It strikes me in 29A, the crime that's, that's offered to sort of, I guess, go with uh, subsection three of 29 regular uh, requires going armed with a dangerous weapon uh, with the intent to use it against another person without justification. And the entire sort of defense wrapped up in instruction 29 is justification defense. And so it strikes me as those things are circular. So uh, we have thought about that circularity. And the way I resolved it was by stepping back and considering the circumstances of this case. And to the extent that we can, what the legislator might have, legislature might have intended by modifying our Castle Doctrine it, to be um, rather rough. Let me, let me put it this way, um, please. Uh, I divine intent only from the words of that statute. So looking at the words of the, of the two statutes, when we are making a vagueness challenge, we have to ask ourselves, and besides, this is an as-applied challenge as to this particular defendant, okay? So when we do that, we have to ask, first, does this statute or these instructions, do they provide sufficient notice that a person of ordinary intelligence, and I'm offering this less for your benefit than for our audience, that the notice is sufficient to govern an adequate, um, adequately and govern the behavior of police. And we do so by looking at this court's instructions, this court's rulings, and what have you. And so as to this particular defendant, is there any conception, is there any notion that, the, that this particular defendant might not understand that what he is doing is criminal or at least illegal? And there is no set of circumstances presented in this case where one might think that that's not true. So to the extent that both instructions, we have the justification instruction and then that description of going armed with intent without justification to the extent that they both use the same word, we might find that that's a definitional uh, difficulty, but it's not one that I would think would trouble the person who has initiated a fight, continued a fight, and then secure in the knowledge that he has brought a gun to a fist fight. It's not an as applied challenge. I think there's some dispute about that here. I know, I know the state's position is that there isn't, but facial challenge. What's the answer? Oh, if it's a, uh, we get to all roads do lead to Rome. I think we get to the same place. If it's a facial challenge, we're still wondering, you know, would another person or any other person conceivably wonder if their behavior might be governed by this? In other words, would they? Would somebody who um, comes loaded for bear, menacingly and and because, and that's by definition without justification, right? Uh, I'm not just trying to be colorful. But somebody who is engaged in that kind of behavior, ought they to know uh, in general that they're not entitled to stand their ground. They have to retreat. And so if you consider it that way, then this uh, f fog of vagueness, if you will, dissipates rather quickly. Um, these aren't definitional instructions. We're not looking for perfection. Any lawyer secluded in the comfort of their office, um, who is not named Daryl, by the way, can come up with an error of, of greater or lesser magnitude. Follow up on that, if I understand it correctly, the challenge, at least as it's briefed, is not to the statute. The claim is that the instruction is vague, not the statute. Isn't that right? could be correct, um, and it may be technically a better way to think about it, but to the extent that there's no daylight between the instructions and the law, then the considerations probably collapse upon themselves. Um, and besides, there's little argument that the instructions were an incorrect statement of the law as it existed in 2020. Fight.
the defendant did. I mean, whatever else we might think about Curtis Smothers, whether he had a restraining order out against him, um, whether he knew that his daughter, that he, whom he hadn't seen for two years, was going to be there, okay? There is no mistaking from this video the glee that that man experienced when he saw his daughter and hugged her. But he had a minute and 22 seconds to live from that point. And so it was the defendant that first insulted him. Now, that may have bothered the victim, okay? And it surely did. But he wasn't the one to throw the first punch. Nor was he the one to continue the fight after the daughter-in-law had separated them. I've watched the video a few times, <clears throat> and there obviously is no audio. Was there testimony? I'm sure you know the record better than I do. Was there testimony? What were the words? Because the interactions... I, I, I've seen it, and I've tried to figure out who moved first, who swung first. I mean, it's, it's a pretty good video, but it's not. I, w I want to try and pinch it, which you can't do. But um, was there any testimony as to the words that were exchanged initially? Um, so let me answer in the best possible light for the defense, okay? So let's assume that um, the widow was correct when she testified that the defendant said, hey, you funny, what you want? Okay, which was the first insulting thing to say. Now, there is some confusion about whether, whether or what was said after that, but we do have the testimony of the disinterested witness, Mr. Rogers, who said that the victim said, once the weapon was first brandished, which, by the way, would, not, would have likely have ended this thing if he had just not pulled the trigger, because the victim said, what are you going to do? Shoot me in front of my daughter? The answer then is no. The answer is to do what he continued to do, follow the line of retreat that he had available to him, follow, in fact, the line of retreat that he took. It presented no obstacle to him. And so then walk away. That was his reasonable alternative. That was his avenue of retreat. He didn't take it. The constitutional and legal claims here lack merit, which is not to say that they're not worth making. I don't, for a moment, tend to labor that. Uh, but f for these reasons, we say there was no error. The error, if there was, was harmless. And we respectfully ask that this court affirm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mullen. Ms. Knipper? What defendant, or what uh, defendant said was, ain't you funny? What you want, what you on. Those aren't aggressive terms. What the Smothers said back is, I'm going to kill you. I mean, maybe not that immediate instant, but in, in this, you know, melee, the, he tells him he's going to kill him. And he said that. Was there any evidence that, that the victim had a weapon or did he brandish anything in, in when, when that was said? There is no evidence of that, but he has a history of violence, and uh, Mr. Ellison knows about that history of violence that he had against uh, Mr. Ellison's wife. So, and I, the, he has generally, um, I mean, his own friends say that he was an aggressive person and um, angry. You know, uh, Daisy, she testified that he was angry. The Miss. Um, the widow testifies that, you know, he looked at her with hate. And, and so, I mean, these are strong words to describe what this guy's demeanor was like. So he's, uh, Mr. Ellison had reason to be fearful. And he was, like, as I said, backing up. There were quite a few people to see. And some people were from the victim's car. Some people were from the area right outside their home. But other people retreated during that interaction. Weren't there people coming and going? Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen the video. But I mean, there were people there that kind of you know, tried to pull these guys apart. I don't remember if there were people going. Oh, I, I do take that back. I think one person I know of that left. Is this an as-applied challenge? For I, um, 
I think there's grounds here to do as applied and on its face. And how is it on its face? I mean, it does seem to be pretty particular to these instructions. Before you can even do an as applied, I believe you have to do uh, on its face analysis. And um, could you repeat your question? Uh, Mr. Mullins argued that this is an as applied challenge. And so in looking at the illegal activity issue, we would look at whether, uh, whether Mr. Ellison would have sort of understood that what he was doing was not lawful. And so, but the illegal activity phrase as it's, as it's set forth in the statute in subsection three, uh, does strike me as a bit vague. So does that mean that, uh, you know? Vague between, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I think it's particularly vague that in that Mr. Ellison is thinking at that time, here is this aggressive person, and so then he pulled his gun to, to make him go away, and then he shot him. Now, but he's thinking he's acting in self-defense. So I think, it, it, and in no way would I, would I think that he would have thought he was going armed with, with intent when he was only reacting to this person. I mean, what, what specifically is your argument? What word do you think is vague? I mean, is it like a sh Shoplifting? Is it? Yes. it Th that's unlawful. <laughs> Dealing drugs? Yes. Uh, assault? Yes. I mean, I. I uh, felon in possession of a firearm, which in a sense the defendant overachieved by getting that excluded. Um, in Baltazar, we said that could be the illegal activity and could negate the, the ability to use stand your ground. I think they were challenges of the phrase illegal activity and it seems not only not vague it's pretty clear it's conduct prohibited by statute and maybe in this particular circumstance your client may have been confused about whether or not he was engaged in illegal activity but as a legal term it doesn't seem vague to me so i want to understand what your argument is right to me, it does seem vague. It just—it doesn't seem to be a reasonable application of this uh, the statute. If so, one of my examples is someone is a drug dealer in their home, and somebody in, burglarizes a home and then, then threatens them, and they react. Are they denied the justification defense because they happen to have drugs in their home? I mean, I think that's the, the kind of the quandary here, and I, I don't think illegal activity should apply to a simple misdemeanor and a Class A felony. I see my time is up. The case of State versus Ellison is hereby submitted. And we will take a pause for just a couple minutes and hear the case of State versus Tucker. For those schools who are clicking off, thank you for joining us. For those who may be staying for a second argument, it should start in just about a minute or two. <laughs>